No, let's see this mouse is going to work. It's not going to work. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right, let's, I'll talk about cycles later in the lecture. Uh, what I want to talk about is pricing. How do you make a profit? Well, I was asked to go more slowly. I just realised I'm about I'm slightly less than halfway through my slide, so I, I apologise for how fast I go, but it's partly the amount of material. I am recording the slides, and I do, will put them up videos on, on study space from, this, from the last lecture. Not this, I didn't record the first lecture, unfortunately. Yeah. Ah, oh, it's joining. <laughs> Next time you with both hands. <laughs> you did, great. Okay. So the question is, how can you borrow money? How can you borrow money and make a profit? I missed that one. I'll talk to you later. Okay. And what Schumpeter is saying is, the actual creation of money is part of how they make a profit. So you have, when you have the creation of money by the banks. That is an additional injection of money into the system. It didn't exist beforehand. And it drives up the price level. And also the innovation that the entrepreneur is doing will give them an advantage over the incumbents. And here I've got a few graphic lectures which are going to go a bit more slowly, I hope, because they're mainly images. So it says entrepreneurial profit is a surplus over costs, okay? which you can't get, some Peter argues, in the circular flow. And... In the circular flow, you just get back what you've put in with the, the idea of a normal profit. So, again, I'll, I, I will put the slides up there. If, you, if they're going too fast to read, they will be downloadable, as they are now, uh, from, the, from the website. So, total receipts have to be greater than cost for an entrepreneur. So, how do they achieve that? And he says, let's take a look at the power loom. I go right back to early in innovation in capitalism back in your produce replacing hand weaving with mechanised production of cloth. And these are some of the forms. This is the original spinning... Uh, it's not called spinning... Uh, is this spinning, Jenny? I honestly don't know my textiles well enough to answer that question. OK. But that's a... You know, enables you to make cloth by pulling together a whole range of threads with a mechanical process rather than having people spinning a, a spinning wheel. And those were the, what the sweatshops looked like. You'll notice the workers are exclusively women uh, in that particular factory. And then these days, you start getting machines that look like this doing the same job. And that technology, at some stages, gets transferred. The capital actually gets physically purchased in a third world country and ends up being in a, a third world location instead. And you start getting this type of technology turning up in producing uh, cloth today. And you may well be seeing chemical production of clothing turning up as well. So. That innovation has been something we've seen occur over 200 years. We're still making clothes in a different way. We will we'll make them differently in the future. So, Sean Peter's argument was, let's say somebody in the, in the textile industry where they're using hand labour sees the possibility of power loom. So you get the idea of mechanising this manual process. And they borrow from a bank to get the money to establish the business. And now a worker with this new technology, going from the idea of the spinning wheel can produce six times as much as somebody using a spinning wheel. So six times the output from one worker. So how do they make a profit? Well, first of all, the price can't fall as much as the reduction in cost that the entrepreneurs enabled to generate. So you can't have... Price will fall with the extra supply when it comes online, but it can't fall so much that it wipes out the profit the person has. Secondly, the cost of the power loom has to be less than the wages of the workers who have been displaced. So it has to say, let's say, that you had five workers being displaced. The power loom has to cost, say, the wages of four workers, not five. Uh, and the cost of buying your inputs can't rise too much. So you, to produce the power loom, you've got to be using inputs you weren't using for manual production, such as buying coal. So the cost of doing that can't exceed the cost reduction you've done by eliminating five of the six workers who used to be involved. Now, if all those three conditions apply, you'll make a profit. It also depends upon the volume of production. But that's his idea. There is a possibility for profit, and part of it comes out of getting hold of that money that you're currently borrowing from the bank. So he said, imagine you've got six workers, I'm using the numbers here, and it's $100 per day, and the machine has a depreciation of $100 per day. So you have these six workers, each costing $100 per day, 
and you get rid of five of them uh, with a machine. So you go from the five, six that are there to one, but you drive wages up by, say, a dollar a day, and there's a rise in depreciation because beforehand you didn't have a machine to depreciate, now you do. So you've got this depreciation turning up there as well. You double the depreciation, I've got a different machine there. So with that done, you've got extra wages, extra depreciation, and the price might be driven down. So it's driven down by uh, the equivalent of $1 a day's uh, turnover. Then you come out with a nice substantial profit anyway, having paid all those costs. So profit falls as more producers move into that area, but that's going to encourage you to continue innovating and adopting new technology. So this is an idea of evolutionary change coming spontaneously and discontinuously out of society. Again, the idea that I'm working on is something which uh, has been around, a form that's been around for 30 years, but nobody's made it visual. I've worked out a way to make it visual. So the entrepreneur plays a crucial role in Schumpeter's vision and the Austrian vision in general of capitalism. It's pretty much absent in neoclassical economics. You've gone from the entrepreneur to the manager, in effect, in the way that they think. And new profit comes out of this development. So if you've done it successfully as an entrepreneur, you've got new goods which have made society richer, the total price is greater than the credit you paid for them, and you can therefore repay your debt, retain some of the credit as profit, and keep the economy ticking over. But Schumpeter says this is going to happen in a cyclical way because the money that you've borrowed actually stimulates demand everywhere. Um, one of my uh, good friends in the finance sector used to talk about sushi as his indicator of the extent to which uh, innovation, credit finance innovation was driving up economic activity because whenever you had a, a new, like a, a boosted telecommunications or dot-com companies and things like that, they'd go out buying sushi for lunch and the sushi manufacturers would benefit from the extra money being borrowed by the dot-com entrepreneurs. So it spills over from one area of the economy to another. So this extra credit which is borrowed by the entrepreneur actually stimulates economic activity across the board. And therefore, money plays an essential role in this vision. It's actually part of generating the cycles we see in the overall economy. And ultimately, you get to a new equilibrium. What then happens? Well, suddenly, the products which you've been spending money to produce adding to demand, driving up wages, driving up prices, etc., etc. suddenly you bring out this new product like the EMP3 player, the first iPod, and you therefore undercut everybody's producing cassette tapes and vinyl records. And you start getting competitors coming in as well. But you start making the companies which you're now competing with, and you didn't exist before this happens, okay? You're suddenly competing with Sony and all the manufacturers of, of cassette tapes and vinyl records with something totally new and totally different, more desirable than what they've got, and you drive down their profit, you therefore cause a decline. And you also, you're paying back your debt. So that combination means you get a cycle coming out of this. There's an initial surge where you innovate, and the innovation drives up economic activity and expands credit. But then in the aftermath, when the goods come onto the market, you pay back that credit as much as you can manage and you drive down the price level and you drive other businesses out of, out of existence because they can't compete with you. So Hayek, uh, if you look at Hayek's little argument here, um, I'm not sure I actually still image or I actually play this one. <laughs> Up too. 
Now we're getting into macroeconomics there, but the idea about the credit expansion causing the economy to boom and then a bust coming afterwards, a process of booming to bust is an essential part of the Austrian way of thinking. And I think Schumpeter is the best example of it. So when you look at neoclassical economics, how do they explain the phenomenon we see of booms and busts? Well, they pretty much say there's a stable system subject to exogenous shocks. Now that's the American trade cycle since 1950. The blue line is the average, or the sort of the moving average running through the middle. The red line is the cycles. And the Americans exaggerate it in the way they record the data because they multiply each quarter's numbers by four to get an annualised figure. So it's actually more volatile than the real data is itself. But there must have been a lot of exogenous shocks to explain that. From a Schumpeterian point of view and an Austrian point of view, those are the booms and busts being driven by the expansion and contraction of credit. Okay. And they again tied up with what's happening in industry. So it's an endogenous process from the Austrian point of view. And what they're trying to explain is how do those cycles come about without just using the excuse of saying they're an exogenous shock. So the neoclassical vision of cycles, and again I'm going back to criticising neoclassicals here from an Austrian point of view rather than extrapolating the Austrians themselves. The neoclassical model is like the idea of a rocking horse being hit by a club. Now that's an actual quote from a, one of the first articles in the field by Frisch. And he, he is talking about Nordwitzel's theory of cycles. And Wicksell had the idea of a, a stable system, which he called the propagation system. That's what propagates the shock. And the impulse system that generates the shocks. And this neoclassical point of view is the economy is stable, exogenous shocks come in from outside the economy, things like you know, unexpected droughts, sudden floods, meteors, etc., etc. And those shocks then hit the model, and they're, they're very violent, but rather than having a jerking movement, you get a smooth movement coming out of the, out of the system. And uh, the analogy that, 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 uh, that is quoted here from Frisch says that if you hit a wooden rocking horse with a club, that's his model. Okay? You hit it with a shock, it rocks. Okay? It doesn't move in the same way the shock does. That's the neoclassical vision. Now, the Austrian vision is they're endogenous. The cycles come out of the economy itself. So, and this is again with Hayek rather than, rather than with Schumpeter. The Hayek says that money... Uh, is what variations in the amount of money cause those cycles. So Schumpeter is more complicated and I think more realistic than Hayek on this front. Hayek's explaining the cycles out of the money system alone. Schumpeter's saying that money system enables innovation to occur and that causes real cycles as well as, as monetary ones. So a lot of the uh, Austrian critique of economics comes down to criticising the monetary system and they basically say that First of all, they accept that prices converge to equilibrium. And then they say the price of money is the interest rate. And they, this is then disturbed by the fact that banks can create money. Now, their explanation, this is not Schumpeter now. Schumpeter is a richer version, I think, than what the Austrians talk about. But what the Austrians tend to say is, well, because the money supply can rise and fall, as, as that rack was saying beforehand, that's what causes the cycles. Interest rates are too low, a boom occurs, the boom means interest rates rise, then the cycle goes the other direction, and they see the creation of money and the pricing of money as being a factor causing those cycles. So the explanation that most Austrians will have for the cycle, if you talk to them, will be something about the money supply and how we need to go back to full reserve banking or private banking. Whereas Schumpeter is saying this would exist anyway because what the cycle, what the money system enables you to do is enables entrepreneurs to function. So having said, and at the end, of, I, I am mixing together some different perspectives here. As I said, Schumpeter I regard as much, much richer than the Austrians in general. And there's an overlap. So Schumpeter has a theory of innovation being financed by credit and therefore credit plays an essential role and though it causes cycles, you don't want to get rid of it. Whereas the Austrian vision is to say, well, cycles come out of the monetary system, and if we made the money system not based on fractional reserve banking, we'd reduce cycles. Okay. So it's two different views there. Now, let's see. 
So they're saying the interest rate doesn't fulfil the function of enabling. What they normally talk about is, again, with the, the idea of supply and demand is still something in Austrian thinking. So they think if you have a system not subject to, to disturbances, the market will reach equilibrium, and that means the interest rate should do that in the money system. They say, well, it doesn't actually in the money system. Why not? And their argument is that there's something different about the creation of money. And this is quoting Hayek here. So in the absence of money, interest would, would prevent an excessive production of goods and you'd get stability because you just produce enough to finance what was provided by savings. But with the banking system, you go beyond that. And that is because free money is created from the accumulation of savings. And he's now blaming the capacity of banks to create money for causing the cycles in the first place. So it's a criticism here. So I've, I've jumped a bit from Schumpeter, who sees that being a creative part of capitalism. Again, this is one of the things about understanding that people are coming from different perspectives. And your job, because you are really at a very, very unusual time in economics, is to bring this together, to bring out, I think, the strengths of these some of the different schools. You can see I've got a lot of time for the Austrians in general, particularly Schumpeter. But I think some of the stuff they say is equally naive. So it's very hard to, to drill through and work out what makes sense, what is ideological. This stuff, I think, is rather ideological. He's talking about the banking system. This is Hayek now. And saying that we have to explain why we get cycles in a monetary system which we wouldn't get in a barter system. Again, that's seeing barter as the ideal model in that sense. And that also is something the neoclassicals tend to do. And he says, well, it's possible to alter the quantity of money in existence through what banks do, through what they call as fractional reserve banking. So they criticise central banks for creating too much base money. They, what they're seeing is that the banking system, the private banking system, the Austrians argue, uh, takes government-created money and then amplifies it through the money multiplier. And they say, well, if therefore the central bank creates too much base money, the banks will amplify that too much, and you'll get a cycle coming out of that. And if the central bank sets the rate of interest below the normal rate of profit, you'll get too much borrowing going on, which will also cause a boom, which is unnecessary. So if you saw that high Keynes rap I showed you a moment ago, he's criticising the government for causing the cycle by creating too much money or keeping the rate of interest too low. So that's blaming the Fed for the cycle. So uh, let's see, let's go through. Okay. So they're using the money multiplier. This is, this is not Schumpeter. This is now back to Hayek, who's more pure Austrian in that sense. And as, as you saw us praising Hayek beforehand, here I'm quite critical of him because I think he's got a very naive model of money creation. I'll talk a bit about why I think that next week when I talk about post-Keynesians. But here he's talking straight out of the money multiplier model you'll again get in your textbooks. So what he says is uh, a bank creates, has, gets a certain amount of cash deposited. Uh, the bank keeps a certain fraction of that, say 10%, and then lends out the other 90%, and then that ultimately creates $1,000 worth. That's, you would have all learned that at school? You did economics, you remember? Okay. It's wrong. Okay. I'll explain why it's wrong next week. But he accepts this wrong model of money creation and then criticises the government for creating too much base money or setting the money multiplier too low and then causing a boom coming out of that, which is unnatural, which much leads to a bust. If you go back and look at that rap, you'll get a good feeling of high exposition there, which is definitely not the same as Schumpeter's. So by creating new credit, this gives a possibility of expanding production and then that... Um, isn't slowed down by raising interest rates, and therefore you get a boom in that part of the in, in the part of the economy. But you then have a bust later. So he's the Schumpeter sees a boom and bust as a necessary and, and essential and in a lot of ways creative part of capitalism. What Hayek is arguing here is that all the government's fault, and the banking system amplifies this, and interest rates don't dampen it down. So I'm sorry for being throwing two elements in there at once, but I think they're, they're both coming from a similar perspective. So even within a particular school of thought, you can get divisions and differences. Again, I want you to keep that in mind when you're learning the neoclassicals as you go through the course you're going to do with us here. So you see, again, over-equilibrium, 
production coming out of the boom stage when the money, too much money has been created, you're going to necessarily have a slump later on. So the elasticity, the volume of money, that's what he's blaming for the cycle itself. Schumpeter is saying that elasticity lets you finance entrepreneurs. So very similar perspective on capitalism in general, different on this particular point, and clearly I think uh, Schumpeter is the one who's, who's better off there. Um, so what Hayek is doing in this particular critique is he's seeing banks as the main creators as money, but he, he doesn't see that they create debt. This is a big mental hole, I think, in the Austrian school in general. But they leave out, they talk about banks creating money, but they don't think, well, that means banks create debt as well. And what does that mean for the economy? I'll talk about it more next week when I talk about Minsky, who's somebody who also bridges between the uh, Austrians and the post-Keynesians. So Schumpeter is better at explaining cycles, because he says uh, you'll get new enterprises turning up, which are credit-financed, and then they then undermine existing businesses. And he said, it's necessary, it's non-equilibrium because it's discontinuous, it doesn't happen smoothly. So he said, innovation tends to happen in waves. And now what he has to explain, and this is why I find that particular book such a fascinating book from the point of view of economics, he knew he had to explain why he thought they occurred discontinuously. He needed a consistent argument. And he said, it could be possible that these transitions from one technology or other occur smoothly. Uh, and if that was the case, you wouldn't get a, a, a cycle. you just get a deviation from a trend. You wouldn't get ups and downs all the time. But he says, in fact, these things do occur in clusters. When a new technology comes along, it tends to occur in a cluster. And then after the boom, there's a slump, and you won't get that same growth after the, after the event. So he said, if you had just random appearance of new enterprises, then you wouldn't get any particular macroeconomic cycle coming out of that. But he says they're clumped for several reasons. He said, firstly, often combinations don't come out of existing firms. They appear side by side. That's going to undermine existing firms. But credit that's being extended to the entrepreneur actually causes a boom. So if you imagine if somebody actually does get you know, $100 million as a loan to develop some new technology in some particular town, those people will have to move to people have to move to the town. They buy goods and services. It stimulates the other businesses. You get a localized boom. Now, beyond that, he says, when you have this new credit being extended, the fact that some entrepreneurs succeed means other entrepreneurs find it easier to get credit as well. So the first person getting a hundred million dollar loan makes it more possible for the next person to get. 100 or 150 million dollar loan. Think about all the businesses now that are getting involved in space travel. Originally it was just Elon Musk was the first one. Now you've got Jeff Bozo and you've got, oh, is it my Bozos? Pardon me. And um, what's his name? Branson. Pardon? Branson. Thank you, Branson. Couldn't think of it. Thank you. Um, so you get the possibility of more finance coming out of the fact that one gets finance in the first place. So that is what enables new ones to turn up all the time. They come up in clusters because one turning up and getting funding makes it feasible another one's going to get funding. A sort of a form of herding occurs. And the danger is, of course, that you might get bad ones getting funding as well. So what you get is what, tech, what engineers call a positive feedback process. The occurrence of one thing, which is a plus, leads to another thing, which is a plus, and feeds back on the original source, which is another plus. You get a runaway cycle. So... The one in invention makes other inventions uh, able to get finance. One success makes other success able to succeed. And the finance spills over beyond just the single industry being funded because people have to eat. Okay? It goes beyond just the technology itself. It, it feeds into the rest of the economy. Whereas economic theory in general, neoclassical theory, works on the idea of negative feedback. So negative feedback is something you get an impulse in and something else reduces the impact of that. That's a negative feedback. The classic negative feedback you all experience on a regular basis is you're in a car and you hit a bump. The shock absorber gives a negative feedback to reduce, to damp the size of the cycle. We're talking, what Schumpeter is talking about in the economy, are positive feedbacks. New profits turn up, that encourages new people to come in the industry, and that then stimulates the economy overall. So many, many processes in the real world are actually positive feedback, not negative feedback. And 
important part of Schumpeter's thinking that he brought that in. So you get driving at the price of products, but then ultimately the new products come onto the market. So at the beginning, the technology causes a boom and the financing of that technology causes a boom. But when those products turn up, it then causes a slump because once, once the products are being sold, it drives out, it makes the other businesses less profitable and also they're paying back the debt. So new goods are undercutting old ones and the money supply is no longer growing because that finance is already being spent and is now being paid back. So you see the time that it takes to go from innovating a product to actually selling it as being the length of the boom. Then when the boom turns up, prices fall because MP3 players undercut cassette players and ultimately wipe them out. And then you go back to a depression. Now what he calls a depression we would call a recession these days. But he sees the boom and recession as a necessary part of the overall behaviour of the economy. And so when the, when the technology is being financed, you have a boom. When it comes on stream, you have a recession. But it's in that transition to the recession, that's when the product actually takes over the market. So he sees negative as, positive as well as negative aspects to a cycle. Okay? Rather than being anti-cycles, Schumpeter is saying, well, cycles were a, a necessary part of capitalism. If you didn't have that boom, if you didn't have... Well, the bust comes about because of the boom. If you want to eliminate the, bur the bust, you may end up eliminating the boom as well. But the boom is where the innovations occur. So he sees the cycle, or what he calls a depression, a recession, he sees it as a natural part of capitalism, and he thinks it's going to continue going away. So you have the fall in demand for the means of production, uh, volume of employment also falls, money incomes fall, you get a deflation, bankruptcies occur, all the companies that are underwritten, undermined by the new, by the new, uh, by the new company. So the boom leads to a bust. Again, that's what you saw with Hayek's argument, but the vision that Schumpeter has a more, is a more creative one of that entire process. So you have overcompensation, you go below equilibrium. You go above with the boom, you go below with the slump. And the equilibrium itself changes the nature, of, or the, the boom itself changes the nature of the economy as well. And again, think about your own experience. Could you imagine a world without the internet? You could? Well done. <laughs> okay. So, what, and I, I like the way that uh, people like Ed Nell describe this. Uh, Ed invented the term of transformational change. So, if you think about the way we tend to model what happens in the economy, we talk about a, a you know, 3% rate of growth, 2% rate of inflation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what we're actually having is not just growth in a quantitative sense, we're transforming the nature of society at the same time. So growth isn't just a quantitative thing, it's transformational. And that's, I'd say, Ed Nell's very good term for it. So, actually, I think I've actually... That looks like I've um, doubled up with that particular set of phrases there. But this then raises the question from the Austrian point of view, what do you do about recessions? Now, when you look when Hayek wrote, he wrote his book, which was the one, in some ways, the debate with Keynes was about, uh, that, that, that the rap satirises. He wrote that in 1932. At that stage, unemployment in America was 25% of the population. It still is the biggest downturn in the history of capitalism. And the government at that time was actually quite small. When you look at the size of the government back then, it was about one-fifth the size that it is now in terms of its contribution to uh, government spending, or to total spending. So if you look at the scale, that's giving you an idea of the scale of the recession in the Great Depression. You had unemployment... Um, and that's, that's actually a percentage rate of growth. You had a big boom in the 1920s, medium growth, and then a slump here where your rate of growth actually got down to, in 1932, minus 15% per annum. So the economy was falling that fast, and we're not talking about a peripheral economy like Greece, we're talking about the world's biggest capitalist economy. So Hayek's policy advice was let the market sort it out. He thought the market would get over that problem. So uh, we, we said we don't try to explain the boom by monetary factors from a, a neoclassical point of view, but we're now willing to blame tight money for causing the crisis. Um, and the people who thought there was nothing wrong during the boom now think there's something totally wrong at the moment and want to intervene. 
Um, so they're thinking we should stop prices falling. Having caused them to rise too much during the boom, according to Hayek, he's saying they're now trying to stop them falling very much. But he said we should actually let that fall happen. He was in favour, in other words, of laissez-faire during the Great Depression. Now, if you look at the actual crisis in more detail, what actually happened to growth at that period, that you can just make out the red colour there. That's zero. Okay? So anything above that, you've got a you've got uh, overall nominal growth. But below that, you've got negative growth. And with the blue line is below that point, you've got deflation. The inflation rate is actually negative. Now, he was writing at this stage, and he really thought that the economy would correct itself and get back to equilibrium after. And what actually happened was it did recover for a while between uh, the between the 30s and the no, between 1930 and 1932, and the 32 to 34 there's positive growth, but it fell back into deflation and negative growth again at the end of the Great Depression. And that was a total surprise to the neoclassicals. It was also a surprise to the Austrians, where they thought this cycle was all over. Why did we fall back into it again? They really don't have an explanation from that point of view. So he was, he was saying deflation can be damaging, okay? but he thought it's a secondary effect. It isn't actually what's causing the crisis. So he said deflation uh, isn't the original cause. Uh, we can't necessarily get out of it by preventing deflation. So he was arguing against doing anything. Let the economy recover. Because this is the period that gave us the right of the Nazis in Germany, led to the Second World War. It wasn't exactly an a economic decision without social consequences. So he was just saying, let the market recover itself. Again, I know there's a huge amount of text here. The lectures are already up on the, on the website, so do on the, on the study space, so do download them to have a good look and, and read through more carefully than I'm giving you time for here. But they saw the, the, they saw the deflation as an effect of unprofitableness of the industry, and therefore why should you try to sustain something which is actually making a loss? And they said if the government tried to restart the private credit system, um, then the depression would last longer. They actually blamed the extent of the depression on the government itself. Now this again becomes a, a huge debating point in economics. What caused the Great Depression? Why did it last so long? And can we do anything about it? And this is something you'll find, of course, a dramatic range of views in the different schools of thought about whether you, what you, whether you can do anything about it and what causes those crises. He's definitely on the side of saying you shouldn't do anything about it and the crisis is actually, if anything, caused by government policy causing a boom. Again, take a look at that rap. And then the, we have the slump afterwards because of government intervention. So, in effect, he's also saying you can't solve the problem by what caused it. So, if government intervention caused the crisis, then you can't use government intervention to stop the bad consequences of the crisis. So, they think the slump will simply end when all the disequilibrium is overcome. We need to adjust. This is again quoting from Hayek at the time. We need is a readjustment of those elements of the structure of production of prices, which existed before the deflation and made industry unprofitable. Um, just give it time for that to happen. Don't try to stop it. But again, it was a laissez-faire attitude. Let the system correct itself. Now, he lost out to Keynes. That's the whole point of the rap. Keynes is like, we should intervene and do something about it. One over instead. But if you look at what policy was, what was the government policy before the crisis actually hit? In fact, it was to run a surplus. And we all, you've all heard of the expression called the New Deal? Okay. The stimulus packages during the Great Depression that Roosevelt did to try to get the economy out of recession. When you look at the scale of the New Deal in terms of percentage of GDP, there's the zero line, so that's a balanced budget. The maximum scale of the New Deal was about 5% of GDP. Now, to give you an idea of how that compares to what we've been through most recently, when the Obama stimulus package plus also the automatic stabilisers in the government system hit in 2009, 2010, the government uh, uh, deficit was 15% of GDP. So three times the scale of what we call the New Deal. Now the New Deal, looking back historically, we see it as, the Keynesians would argue, it's a major reason why the economy turned around, but it's actually quite a tiny stimulus compared to what we have now. The point I really want to focus on, though, is the government in the 1920s 
believed it should run a surplus. So throughout the 1920s, and they believed us running a surplus would mean the economy would work better. Again, it's very much like what you would have seen with the Tories in the last few years, what they call Labor's Great Recession, okay? saying the government should run a surplus and therefore the economy will work better. This is the only time in the history of America where they had sustained government surpluses for more than one or two years, a whole decade. It was followed by the worst economic, hist economic performance in America's history. But just keep that little factoid in mind. Okay. Running a surplus is supposed to mean everything works perfectly. That wasn't perfect. So and when you look at the return to... When, when the recession, uh, the second downturn occurred, when the economy went back into a slump, I, I, I don't have the figures on the screen here, but if you look at the unemployment data on one of the earlier charts, you'll see the point. The unemployment peaked at 25% in 1932. It then fell to 11% by about 1936 and then it rose to 20% again in 37, 38. And what was going on at the same time was Roosevelt was persuaded to return to surplus. So there's a dramatic reduction in government spending at the time. And the result, though, that, that at the same time what occurred was an increase in unemployment. Now, economists will dispute what the causal relationship was between the two. The Austrians would reject it, but it's rather hard for them to say, well, if the government did what you thought it should do and got out of the way, why did the economy fall back into a slump again? And if the government was doing what you thought it should do for the decade before the crisis, why did the crisis occur? So those sorts of factual questions come out of the data. I think when you look at the, the percent of the workforce that was out of a job, that's the unemployment chart. So here you see unemployment peaking in 1932 at 26% of the workforce, then falling to 11%, 37, 30, 37, 38, and then exploding again. And Keynes's book pretty much hit... America at this point. So the for a while it looked like if you're thinking in terms of Austrian versus Keynes's ideas about how to manage the economy, it looked like letting laissez faire work was working. For that period you fell from twenty six percent to eleven. Extrapolate that forward, everything looks fantastic. Then suddenly this happens. Okay. So at that point it not just the Austrians but a lot of neoclassicals despaired because the economy wasn't returning to equilibrium. It wasn't self correcting. And that was a major shock to those two schools of thought. So I've raced through again. I'm sorry again about the speed. I've, I, I, I've, I should actually give myself time notes and know that I can actually finish this lecture with 20 minutes more slowly. So I'll try to do that next time round. But again, as I said, the slides will be up there on the study space. I'll put these up there as well. See you all next week.